Hello everyone and welcome to Pascal's Wager after round three of the Candidates 2020 tournament. The most, most exciting sporting event uh, going on in the world right now. I think it's, it's very, hard to, uh, very hard to compete with us right now because we actually have an event and that's something that uh, most people unfortunately uh, cannot say. So uh, we are very lucky to be seeing some chess and uh, I am happy to be able to, to present to you uh, present to you these games and, and happenings of today. So we, uh, we had a pretty exciting day today with the two highest rated players in the tournament, Ding Li Ren and Fabiano Caruana, uh, facing each other. And uh, Ding Li Ren, of course, was kind of in a must win or at least must try to win situation to just kind of stay in the tournament. Having started with two losses, I don't know if he's ever started a tournament in his life with two losses. I mean, he probably has, but maybe not not in a very, very long time. And, um, well, as you can see up here, he did win, but it was quite a game. And uh, the other three games, Anish Giri played against uh, MVL. That ended up in a draw, but it, none of the games were uneventful, I would say. Uh, Grischuk's game was probably the most quiet, but he certainly had chances to win. Uh, that game ended in a draw also, but again, it was it was not not what you would call a, a game where he had no chances or where it was just equal all along. He, he definitely had some chances. He's actually had sort of winning chances in every game, uh, but he had no time. And, uh, you know, our uh, pundits did rank him as having major time trouble issues. Uh, of course, that's that's been well known for a long time. He tends to have like a minute left on his clock for 20 moves kind of thing. So... Um, there was actually an interesting discussion today about that in our, uh, or maybe it was yesterday in our broadcast when uh, Peter Heine Nielsen, Nielsen was uh, was with us, and he was saying that he, you know, at some point he thought that maybe it was uh, almost like he was doing it on purpose, like he enjoyed being in time pressure, uh, because it is odd to be incredibly strong and have this like sort of one problem and and but just keep doing it over and over again. Um, and then finally, in the, the last game today, was uh, Alexienko against Nepomnishi. It was a French defense. French defense was kind of important for the fantasy because uh, he was one of the picks that gained uh, some points. Uh, but Nepomnishi played the French defense, not an opening that we see too often, you know, among 2,700, 2,800 players. Um, so that was nice to see. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's go, let's go through all of this. I did also want to show you a couple of moments. Uh, I'll... Uh, We'll start. For, for, we'll start with the Fabiano um, Ding Li Ren game, the Ding I should say Ding Li Ren Fabiano game, because really that's a you know I've been putting uh, this game of the day graphic, which I'm actually gonna we're gonna push it through right now. So this game really could have been game of the day, could have been blunder of the day, and could have been um, key result of the day for sure, because obviously. Uh, a big a big win for Ding Li Ren kind of puts him right back into it. Actually, I, let me actually show you the standings before I start with the game. But in the standings here, sort of a big wolf pack. We have three players with two out of three: uh, Ian Nepomnishi, Maxim Vashilagrav, and uh, Wang Hao with two points. So you know all of them at plus one. Then we have Fabiano and Grishuk with uh, an even one and a half score. Um, and then Alexeyenko, Giri, and Ding Li Ren have one point. Uh, Ding Liman has not had any draws yet, which is a pretty pretty surprising uh, pretty surprising result for him. Um, but really, it's it's still anybody's game, especially because none of the leaders are the people that were considered to be tournament favorites. Although I do have MVL in my fantasy bracket to win the overall tournament, I thought with 60 points that he was a good uh, a good pick. Um, I am not otherwise doing very well, so I really need him to pull through for me. Uh, if I want to have any chance to win the overall contest. Uh, Magzi Magnus is actually doing reasonably well in these fantasy contests. And of the star players that we have, John Ludwig Hammer is, I think, in the top 40 or top 50 of the overall contest right now in the fantasy contest. So, um, uh, But amazingly, though, we've had the same leader in fantasy every single day. So Mr. Diddy has been leading the, the overall contest every single round which is pretty surprising, but his lead is now really narrow. So anyway, let me start with this game because it's really, it's really a fascinating game. Um, and so it starts, it actually started with a surprise. I think, um, oh, I never pushed through the standings actually. These were the standings in case you didn't see, in case you didn't see them uh, on, the, on the board here. Uh, I'll leave them up for a second and then I'll switch back to the game of the day graphic. Um, so it started with a little bit of a surprise, Fabiano playing the Slav. He's been mostly going for, you know, Things like uh, 
Dimzos and Catalans. So, I mean, of course, he has played the Slav in the past, but not so recently. So, um, Ding Luren spent a little bit of time, but decided to go for the most the most uh, critical variation of the Slav, one could say, which is to play knight f3, knight c3. Uh, you know, of course, the lines with e3 a little bit more quiet, and uh, and so, uh, but he goes, you know, he decides to go for the more aggressive choice, which makes sense given that he had lost two games. So this is a tournament where, you know, you're not really, you're really playing to win. Finishing in fifth place doesn't do anything, so, uh, so you kind of have to go for it. So he plays knight e5. Again, this is the most, this is the most critical line. e6, f3, bishop b4. Uh, now, of course, the old line was to play, uh, you know, e4. That's not what Ding Ren plays in this game. e4, bishop e4, this whole thing. Um, which, uh, you know, bishop d2, queen d4, knight e4, queen e4, uh, and so on. But, uh, so that this was, you know, popular a long time ago, um, and has been sort of overanalyzed. Uh, and so now white players have been uh, started to play something else. They play knight takes c4, black castles, and then the move king f2. Um, by the way, if you play king f2 first is, a, is an old trap, bishop c2. Uh, and already black is better. So this is something that is actually important because uh, this pattern does occur in the game as well. So he takes on c4, castles, sorry. And let me put my game of the day graphic up now. <clears throat> All right, so castles, king, F, king f2. And now Fabiano plays a move that has never been played before and looks just extremely odd, e5. And now to, to play this move uh, requires having done a lot of preparation. And Fabiano blitzed out the next, like, a whole lot of moves. And so it really is kind of a shocker, a shocker of a move. I mean, it gives the pawn in two different ways. Um, neither, neither capture is, like, bad, is at least not obviously bad for white. So Ding Li Ren, of course, you do have to capture. Um, Ding Li Ren uh, chose... Actually, e4 is a, is a third possibility, and eventually you capture. Um, but e4, e4, I think, would be met by e takes d4. We're not going to go through this one just because, again, there's, there's so much to look at here. Um, but uh, we will look, so Ding Li Ren played knight takes e5. We will look a little bit at pawn takes e5, which was also very natural. And now there's two moves for black, and I think one of them is better than the other. So I, I'm guessing Fabiano was going to go for knight d7. If instead of knight d7 you go knight d5, then e4, uh, knight takes e3, queen takes queen, rook takes queen. Now, white has two reasonable moves, actually, um, reasonable looking, anyway. Um, b takes c3 is probably the most natural, and I think this is, you know, I think if Ding Li Ren thought he could get this position, he would have been quite happy. You can play either rook a3 or, or, um, or rook b1, say bishop d4, bishop b3. And I think this is a pleasant position for white. The majority is pretty strong. Um, so, and there's a few versions of this. Uh, one I was going to show also is on, um, after rook takes d8, there was also the possibility of capturing this bishop. And now black has a weird move, knight d1, which kind of forces the king onto a strange square. Um, king g3, there's bishop e1 check, so you kind of have to go to e2. Um, and it, this is just a messy position. I'm not going to, you know, go through the longest lines, but it's, uh, it's messy. Um, so, uh, so I think, you know, instead of pawn takes f5 here, uh, pawn takes knight might be a better option. And I like that variation for white. However, after pawn takes e5, knight d7, and this gets really complicated. I'm pretty sure this is what Fabiano would have played, but let me give you uh, some examples. Sorry, I hit my uh, camera here. So e4, uh, bishop e6, and then the thing is that black basically just plays against the, the exposed king, and they'll do things like knight a6, queen c7, f6, or f5, and again, there's a lot of variations, but I think maybe this is what black was going for. This still seems like a, kind of a safer way to play than what he went for, because um, what he went for got really complicated really fast. So he goes knight takes e5. Now Fabiano uh, immediately, without thinking, plays bishop c2, the same motif that we've seen, so that's not too surprising. Queen d2, c5. Clearly this is preparation, right? And this is what's kind of amazing, is that he clearly got what he wanted in this game. Um, 
and yet somehow he lost. And so this is this is the second game where this has happened in this tournament. Not to Fabiano, but in uh, in the first round, Anish Giri was playing against Nipomnishi, um, was incredibly well prepared, seemed to get you know this crazy computer analysis, and yet like he lost. And so um, this is kind of the goal, right, of opening preparation today is to get into a complicated position that that you've looked at with the computer and so therefore you kind of know the best moves you don't have to figure everything out um but in in these two cases the opponents you know and sometimes that means you're you're going for maybe an inferior move or at least something that's that's so complicated that you know you feel like your opponent won't be able to play correctly even if it's not necessarily the very best move so here dingley ren played d5 i was actually surprised to see this just because um you know, e3 seemed to be a fairly safe alternative, uh, but uh, but he went, you know, he went for the most ambitious and the most, uh, and this is not to say that this is simple, this is actually still extremely complicated. Black can play something like bishop g6, and then again, they're trying to play against the exposed king. And the funny thing is that whenever white takes, black just doesn't care about the center, just wants to open lines, and this position is considered to be okay for black. There's the check on g4, the king just doesn't get a safe square. Um, so basically black is okay. It's surprising because optically it looks like you've given a bishop pair, you've given a pawn, and you've given up the center. So what else, what do you have, you know? Um, and yet, um, and yet it's not so simple. So um, anyway, he played d5, the most principal move, bishop b3. Fabiano still blitzing everything. e4, rook e8, still blitzing. Queen f4, c4. Now, there's a lot of moves, by the way, in these positions that, like, both sides can play, and it's kind of insanely complicated. Um, doesn't seem like anything is actually bad for white, but black does have play in all of them. Uh, knight takes c4, knight d7. And actually, this moment, I did want to show you something here. Uh, let me actually switch to my other scene here. I didn't want to show you Magnus Carlsen's reaction to the move knight d7, which is just kind of like, oh, you know, I've given up two pawns in the center, and now I'm just going to make quiet moves. Knight d7, knight f8. So let's let's see let's see how Magnus uh, reacted. Let me just pull this up here. Oh, he's just got knight g7. Look wow. at this. Wow! I told you. Wow! <laughs> I told you guys. <laughs> One day you're gonna listen to me. One day. Wow! I know my boy. This doesn't make. Nothing makes sense anymore. This is next level. This is a puck, a, apocalyptic world, post apocalyptic world where just. Yeah. Literally this, is. I'll, I'll get a coffee. This is too much. Lawrence, you take over. I, I got this. I'll... All right. So, as you can see, uh, my, uh, my commentator team was a little bit. Uh, was a little bit surprised by this. So let me go back to the other scene here so I can actually look at the chest. Um, but uh, but that was that, I thought that was quite funny. Uh, so these guys, you know, clearly were very surprised by this plan. And again, Fabiano was just blitzing everything out. So he still got an hour 40, you know, which is what they start with. Uh, so it's, it's very hard to play against someone who's doing that because you always feel like you're about to miss a trick, right? But uh, he keeps his cool, plays the best move here, uh, Ding Nguyen. <coughs> Pardon me. Bishop e3, knight f8, um, you know, it's, it seems odd to play such a slow plan, but he's trying to harass the queen with knight g6, bishop d4. Now, um, arguably knight g6 was actually a mistake, and I'm not sure, I mean, the computer clearly gives this as an inferior move, of course it's to a human, who knows, right? But because Fabiano was still blitzing, we did wonder if maybe he got confused in his preparation, because it looks like if you played rook c8 first, that attacks the knight. Uh, the, the most natural move is knight e3, and now knight g6, that's actually an improved version because the, the queen doesn't have that square, so he's forced to play queen f5. Um, so, you know, we did wonder if that might have happened. Uh, now that this, this, is, this is still a completely unclear position, the computer, uh, I mean, and as a human, you would just have no idea. It looks like black has counterplay, uh, but it's very hard to assess because it's, in one way, it looks like black has a lot of counterplay. The king will never be safe. On the other hand, it's like, if you ever are safe, it's completely winning. And, you know, this is sort of what happens in the game. But anyway, so he played bishop d4, knight g6, queen f5, 
queen f5, again, queen c1, the computer liked much more, and in hindsight was definitely a better move, And because we'll see what happens with this queen. So Fabiano plays bishop c4, um, again, surprising, he's giving the bishop pair and allowing the bishop to, uh, to develop itself. But he does get a clear plan here. Queen c7 is very forcing. Bishop e2, bishop c5. He's forcing the bishop trade. Now here, he's actually spent a long time. So presumably he's out of out of his preparation or can't remember. Uh, probably he's just out of it because I think, you know, he had already sort of made a mistake. Uh, but here it's surprising that he didn't go for rook e5. And what he did was definitely not bad. But rook e5 certainly um, was worth considering. Um, and in fact, the computer gives black as completely okay here, as equal actually. And there's lines like knight f4, and th this queen is actually in trouble, right? And so Magnus and Ali Reza, by the way, this was the first time ever, I think, that Ali Reza Firuja did uh, commentary, and he did that on chess 24 today. Knight h5, you keep harassing the queen as much as possible. And now, uh, for some reason, the positions after queen g4 are just really bad for, for, uh, for white here. Um, well, here there's actually a very concrete reason. F5 is just really strong. Um, yeah, this is just crashing through. Now black is going to win the pawn, maybe pawns back and just be, be have a monster. For example, like here, 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 Fe. Um, and this is just really bad already because uh, the king is not safe. So rook e5, really interesting possibility. Uh, there are better ways for, for white to play. So on knight f4, uh, they can play queen h4. And we can play either g5, um, yeah, we can play g5 here, or or actually one other, th uh, yeah, knight f4. There's also queen g3, knight h5, and then queen h4. Uh, oh, yeah, but this one there's g5. And sorry, these knight moves <laughs> get really confusing. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, no, queen h4 is the best. And then g5. Yeah, now if queen g3, um, knight h5. Yeah, this is the this is actually the the incredible one, and maybe this is what Fabiano was afraid of. There's a move bishop d4 here, and you sort of give the queen back. Well, give the queen actually. Now you have two pieces, and you have a bunch of pawns, and you know, and the position is uh, it looks it actually looks like white could be rolling, uh, white could be rolling here. Right? Like if the rook moves, there's probably rook h7. Actually, no, not rook h7, sorry, it was rook h5. Rook h7, the, the king has a g6 square, uh, just rook h5. And uh, so on queen g3, rook h1, yeah, I remember looking at this, and this is this is actually quite bad for black. But uh, black actually has a move, so instead of uh, taking on e2, um, actually, no, taking on e2 is okay, and now you just play f5. So you just don't worry about this rook. The bishop is worth more than the rook. And, I mean, the computer gives this as equal, and you can see that black is probably fine here. I mean, it's two pieces for a queen with two pass pawns, knight king, but, you know, it's, I mean, basically it's still a mess. Queen c4 is a threat here with f4 check, so just a mess of a position, not simple at all. Uh, but this would have been interesting. So, and this, and this is just such a complicated game. Fabiano, instead of rook e5, plays queen takes e5, and now things start to go a little bit downhill for him. This probably is still okay. He could try rook e5 now. It's not quite as, as strong here, uh, but it was still a reasonable move. He plays h6, and now I think he's he's just trying to prepare it, basically. It's just a little bit too slow. And now uh, Ding Li Ren found a nice maneuver. I mean, the computer actually thinks there's something better than this, but it was a very nice maneuver. He's just playing rook d2, and now his goal is to recycle his queen and, and have his his uh, pawn center. And I thought it, the next few moves are actually quite instructive. Um, he really just focuses not on keeping his, his uh, two pawn advantage, but really just starts to focus on on bringing his queen back in, in the game so that he can free his king, play g3, king, g2. So he was happy to give this pawn back. And now after queen f2, I think um, Magnus said, like, this game is completely over, which I actually was a little bit surprised because I thought maybe black still had chances against the king. But the rest of the game did uh, sh sort of prove him right. Really, Fabiano uh, didn't have any chances. And I'll just, you know, show you the moves really quickly. Um, here, by the way, he decided to sacrifice a piece just because the position was getting really desperate. Of course, this is a disaster, right? Like, you can't, uh, you can't play against the center like this. 
So he sacrifices a piece, but there's really nothing nothing for the piece here. He's not even uh, he doesn't even have two pawns. He only has one pawn, um, and the black king is less safe now. So um, it actually looks a little bit like the position that he had in the game that he won, where he was uh, up a piece. So. Uh, <clears throat> He played on forever. I mean, a lot of people were saying, why is he playing on? And, you know, he's playing on because it doesn't doesn't hurt to play on. So I never blame someone for, for playing on. But, of course, um, of course, there was really no chance here. Uh, and ultimately, he lost. So the other games, uh, like I said, this game could have had blunder of the day just because who knows if this double pawn sacrifice was that amazing. But certainly the novelty of the day because it's, it's a crazy, crazy idea and really kudos to him or to his team for finding it and just too bad that it didn't ultimately work out because it's it's you know that in that sense it's a it's very um very motivating win, motivating win um for white and uh and for him a, a pretty devastating loss but of course he's still one and a half out of three it's a totally normal score uh he's got 11 rounds to go he's got plenty of time to make it up so um we'll go through a couple of key moments from the other games um in the uh MVL game, I did want to show you, um, so it started with a, a bishop d2 Grunfeld, like MVL's, um, his one weakness is that, well, is maybe not his only weakness, but one of the things is that his repertoire is so predictable, we are always sort of in the same variations. By the way, someone asked me in the chat why h6, uh, it seems like he wasted a tempo. h6, it sounds, I mean, it's, it seemed like he was preparing rookie 5 and, you know, take, taking a, a square, uh, Square away from the queen, but really it was a it was a mistake. Like he he just went he just went wrong with uh, it was too slow. And you know Magnus in the chat was saying that it's hard to believe that a move like h6 would be good. And you know it turned out that it really wasn't good. So all right, so this is a one of these kind of kind of quiet lines for White in the Grunfeld, but it does have some venom. And um, oh, so I, I do remember when I did the coverage of the the Wake on Day tournament, and I was sitting next to Peter Zvidler. He was saying that uh, in the Grunfeld, you always have to look for e6, b5, and f5 pawn breaks. And so in this case, you know, MVL goes b5. And again, I want to go quickly here. There was one moment that was a uh, funny uh, here, where after queen d7, Magnus said that this type of uh, move is is a uh, is a sort of a reminiscent of the the French style of suffering, <laughs> uh, the French or the French school style of suffering, uh, of playing chess. And MVL does seem to be willing to defend some pretty tough positions. Uh, he did well holding this though. Um, although there was there was a moment he, he should suffer a little bit more in this position. This is not a fun. The bishop against the knight here um, is definitely uh, is definitely better for White. And this this pawn majority here versus uh, those guys is a useful pawn majority and one that you know you should be able to, to exploit. I mean eventually bring the king in, play g4, f5, something like that. The bishop comes to b3. Um, <clears throat> these pawns are on light squares so they could be targets um, and the deep pawn could fall sometimes. So definitely a position that's worth playing for white. But here um, for some reason instead of playing uh, bishop b3 which would you know force the knight back and then you can play for example bishop c2 uh, and you know you can you can play for 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 a lot of time here you know uh rook c8 you can play rook d2 or actually here you can play bishop d1 then the rook comes back and then you can make a useful move so anyway white white is better here uh instead he plays king f2 just inaccurate um and allows black to play knight b2 rook d2 knight c4 and now there's really no no better thing to do than to make a draw because this position is already totally different once the knight jumps to e3 now they've got a lot of counterplay. So he just kind of messed up and let him make an easy draw. Might have been a draw anyway, but but this definitely made it easier. Uh, next game, and, and an important one for the standings, was the, was the Wang Hao uh, game against Grischuk. Um, started as a Petrov, um, but this position, uh, funnily enough, uh, Magnus Carlson has had this position many times, and he normally gets it, it's kind of funny, by transposition, by doing e4, e6, d4, d5, e, d, e, d, uh, knight f3, knight f6. So we have the exact same position, same, you know, sort of move. Um, it's a complete transposition, uh, but uh, obviously a different way to get through times. Also, I think uh, Bacot, um, who is uh, one of the top French players, uh, has played this a bunch. Um, and so a lot of top players have played this. 
And uh, so all of this is actually relatively known. Um, C3, C5, all of this I think has been played many times before. And it seems like a slightly more pleasant position for white. They get into this end game. And Grishuk actually played this incredibly well. Um, he got this bishop versus the knight, so another bishop versus knight end game. Um, and again, it looked like he was going to torture him forever, but he just spent so much time. So a3 was maybe not the best move, maybe bishop b1 first to, to threaten um, hg, hg, and then g5, followed by taking the d5 pawn. So that was, uh, bishop b1 was a, a, probably a good move. Um, he played a3 first, which is still okay, rook e8. And now, because he's so low on time, I think he had just you know a couple minutes left on his clock, he made a mistake. He played hg, hg, g5. And this allowed black to simplify with knight e4. Pawn takes, well, he actually took with the bishop, but on pawn takes, pawn takes, um, if the bishop moves, there's e3, forking these two. Um, so this position is just a, a draw, right? Rook d7, rook e7. And this is just equal. Um, so Grishuk really let this one slip. I mean, you know, if he didn't play, if he hadn't played g5, I think he has reasonable chances to win. Uh, and this has been the case in every single game that he's had so far. He actually managed to find a sort of a, a tricky way to to play, but it still was was really uh, just equal. And Wang Hao uh, played well to uh, to force a draw. So they just drew here. Uh, and then the, the last game uh, was between uh, Alexenko and Nepomnishi, the two two Russians, um, and it was uh, it started as a, a French. So we almost had two French defenses, right? The other one was a Petrov, but it transposed into a French, uh, and a somewhat unusual variation with H4. I mean, of course, very common, but not as common as say Queen G4. Um, one thing that was a little bit weird is is here. Almost everyone, including Caruana and Nand, you know, this is a very common position. One plays bishop d3. He played bishop e2, and I think none of the com commentators really like that move very much. Uh, not that it's horrible or anything, but it just seems like the bishop on d3 is better placed because here, on every 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 single move, you got to look at this and see if you're losing a pawn, and that just it just doesn't seem to to be necessary. Um, so, but. It turns out that it, it actually got into a fairly interesting position, although I don't think black was ever in trouble. Um, yeah, here I think he probably should have taken with the pawn, and I kind of like black's position. He wants to play bishop b5. Uh, during a post-mortem, post they were talking about c4, but c4 actually pawn takes c4, and uh, here... Uh, actually, here, yeah, they were talking about this during a postmodern, but this just loses to queen e4. So they, you know, they had not looked that deeply, obviously. Um, but b takes c5 just looks like a pretty, pretty reasonable position. I mean, if, let's say, I don't know, queen d2 or maybe bishop d3, actually, Nepomnishi mentioned that move, knight e7. Um, I just don't think white has played very impressively, and this pawn structure is, is pretty weak. Um, so I would have probably played this way. Uh, but in the game, he went rook b4, it, was interest, it, it got interesting, b5, because he decided to go for an exchange sacrifice, which is what we've been talking in these workshops with uh, Joel Benjamin. Uh, bishop d2, knight c6, and now uh, he played queen e2. The thing is, I think Magnus was really liking rook e1 as sort of the same way to do this, but it, it seems like an improved version, um, because the, the queen is free to go to g4 potentially, like after knight takes b4, a b4, Queen e7, knight d4. Actually, no, sorry, on queen e, no, not on queen e7. Um, on queen c7, you can play knight d4. <coughs> um, and uh, now I think, if I remember correctly, on knight e5, we just play bishop f4. Yeah, this just loses. Uh, the pawn on e6 is falling. So uh, the and then on on queen e7. Uh, then you could probably just play h5, and again, the idea is to play knight d4, queen g4, and that seems like a better version of the exchange sacrifice. Uh, in the game, he played queen e2, and uh, so he's forced to lose, lose a tempo to play rook e1, right? So here, knight b8, knight d4, knight c6, and he's just a tempo slower to get the attack. It's still a reasonable position for white, um, and uh, arguably, he's still maybe even better. 
Um, he could have tried bishop takes g6 here, um, and I don't know why he didn't go for that. Uh, pawn takes, queen e6, queen e7, uh, queen c6. Actually, yeah, well, the thing is that this was... This was hard. To, it, it was, to be fair, pretty hard to spot all of this um, in h5. So this is kind of a computer computer variation. I I did a I I, I lost my uh, my word notes. I <laughs> just got the variations here. Uh, but this is actually pretty pretty messy. Gh rookie three looks like he actually had some kind of a win here, but it's obviously very very hard to find. Um, so uh, he played h5, pretty natural. And I guess he just has like compensation for the exchange. I don't know if he, I don't think white is better, but especially because the bishop on a4 is kind of stuck forever, uh, he probably felt like he wasn't in that much uh, danger to lose. And so they played some moves here um, and, uh, and eventually agreed to a draw. Um, but it was a complicated, uh, very complicated game. Uh, and but probably not the the probably not a move that you'll see again. This bishop b2 just seems like an odd experiment. I don't know why. Uh, what was wrong with bishop d3? That's been played by all these these uh, very very strong uh, players. So um, that's going to be just about it for the after show. But by the way, tomorrow um, tomorrow we have banter blitz with some incredible players. We're going to have Ali Reza Faruja for the for I think the first time doing like this kind of banter blitz where he's playing all of our premium members. So become a premium member today so that you can play against Ali Reza tomorrow. Um, and uh, we will have also Jan Gustafsson. I'll be playing banter blitz. We have a whole schedule. I think we have eight hours. Uh, I think we'll have another 2,700 player, probably Sam Shanklin playing tomorrow. Um, Someone's asking me, what do you think of Wang's chances of winning the candidates? I actually always thought that his chances were a little bit better than um, than you know than people gave him credit for. I think he's uh, he's someone who can win games. He's a very talented player. His, his one problem is that he tends to let points slip, as he did you know uh, yesterday uh, when he when he kind of let uh, let Anish Giri uh, wiggle out and make a draw. So he's he's really strong, and you know if if he gets on a roll, he's really dangerous. I mean, he won he's won some some incredibly strong open tournaments. So he's a uh, I think he's a little bit underestimated, and he's got a good start here. So you know I I sort of put him up there uh, right now, especially given the standings with MVL and Fabiano. Um, but really now it seems to be a little bit like a, it's very hard to guess what's going to happen. So. Uh, so it's going to be interesting. That was a, a question uh, in the audience. Um, and then uh, a reminder also that today uh, we have Joel Benjamin uh, joining us for, for a workshop today. I think he's going through some end game. So keep learning. You know, use this time where you're forced to stay home in most, for most of us, including me. And uh, and yeah, I'd like to uh, learn learn some chess from a from a really legendary player. And uh, thanks for tuning in today. Uh, tomorrow rest day, but not a rest day for us at Chess 24. So definitely do stick around, and then uh, and then yeah, it's going to be interesting to see uh, to see uh, the rest of, the rest of the tournament. Uh, next round we have um, Fabiano with White against Nipomnishi. He's going to want to uh, sort of make a stand here with the white pieces. Uh, Wang Hao gets White against Kirill Alexienko, and that's also you know it seems like so far people are trying to beat up on Alexienko. You know he's not he's by no means a, a a weak player, but they're you know they're kind of I think trying against him. So and then we have MVL against Grishuk, uh, and Ding Li Ren with White against Anish Giri, and he's going to look to stay on a roll. So um, so yeah, someone is asking in the chat, will I be doing these recaps also after the rest day? No, I'm not doing a recap uh, on the rest day, um, but I'll be doing a recap after the rest day. So like um, so yeah, like for game four, game five, I'm continuing. These are going to be every day. So I hope uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, I hope you enjoyed today's recap, and I'll see you all. I'm hosting Joel in about uh, 25 minutes, so stay tuned for for the beginning of the, for the beginning of that, and I'll see you then. Thank you very much, and I'll see you soon.